Well, guys, it's um, <clears throat> um, lecture on chapter three. I'm going to start chapter three. This is uh, the first lecture of total four on, on this topic. And this is for September 2nd. September 2nd. And uh, we're going to be talking about amino acids, uh, peptides and proteins. So um, proteins, as many of you know, are the most abundant and most useful um, biological macromolecules. And uh, there is a uh, um, there's a whole chapter on this in this textbook. Uh, just to introduce their what's known as primary structure. Right. So as we know that proteins consist of amino acids and there are 20 most common ones. And so this chapter deals with exactly that. We're, we're going to talk about these 20 amino acids. We're going to talk about their properties and we're going to talk about how these amino acids actually end up in protein and what kind of properties they uh, confer to the proteins. Okay, so let me share my screen. Hold on a second. Let me share my screen. Okay. And so here, here are the slides. So you have those slides. And presentation mode. And as usual, we're going to start with the learning goals, right? So these are the goals that I want you to um, focus on when you study. And these are the goals that um, um, we're going to be using when I want to test you. Let me um, set my timer. Four, eight minutes. Okay. All right. So um, we're gonna first we're gonna focus just on the amino acids themselves, right? Not as part of proteins yet. So we're gonna learn the structures of these twenty amino acids. And let me get my pen. My pen, and so we're gonna learn their structures. We're gonna um, um, learn their uh, chemical structure, basic structural formulas. We're gonna learn about their uh, names. We're gonna learn their three-letter abbreviations, and we're gonna learn their one-letter abbreviation for each amino acid. And then, uh, based on that. Uh, once we have the chemical formula in front of us, we're going to try to predict the chemical properties of each amino acid. Okay. And uh, um, so once these get incorporated into peptides, so each side chain of each amino acid will um, bring some kind of property to the resultant peptide, right? So we're going to learn about that. And in many cases, this depends on the ionization, ionization behavior of amino acids, right? So uh, many amino acids are gonna be uh, neutral, many amino acids are gonna be positively charged, and many amino acids are gonna be negatively charged. And that will uh, totally dictate uh, the properties of the resulting peptide and the properties of the resulting protein. And finally, uh, based on that, we're going to learn actually how to characterize peptides and proteins, how to purify them, how to identify them, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's how to unravel their primary structure. Okay, so four goals. Four goals. And let's follow those. 
as we study. So um, now, as far as proteins themselves, so obviously before we start talking about amino acids, let's just have a brief overview of um, just in general, what protein is doing in the body, right? So um, one of the most important function of all proteins is catalysis, right? So we know that um, um, proteins in the body can uh, behave as enzymes. And what are the enzymes? The enzymes are biological catalysts. The enzymes are biological catalysts and they play a role in the main, basically, you know, there are thousands and thousands of pathways where um, the enzymes are involved. So uh, I'll just give you a couple examples. Enolase, an enzyme in the glycolytic pathway, right? So you know glycolysis, you've heard of that, right? So basically a glycolysis, right? So basically we're gonna break down sugar, so we're gonna break down glucose into energy, right? So an enolase is one of the enzymes in this pathway. Uh, DNA polymerase, um, enzyme involved in um, duplication of DNA or replication of DNA and um, which will the process which will lead to cell division right so um, we know that um, uh, cells if they if you have a normal cell that divides that's part of the physio our physiology uh, which is um, Neutral, it's just a uh, uh, part of normal development, part of normal development of a tissue. And, but if this occurs in a cancer cell, right? So if the, um, if a cancer cell divides, that's a um, harmful process, right? So that will result in the growth of a tumor. So in which case we want in the cancer cell, we want this DNA polymerase crossed out in cancer cell. Like so. All right, so the enzymes is part of the, what proteins do. Another important function of proteins is transport. So oxygen, we know that oxygen has this structure. It's a neutral molecule, right? So this is ground state of oxygen. It's a bioradical neutral molecule, poorly soluble in water, poorly soluble in water. And so you need a transport system, right? And so there is a protein known as hemoglobin. It will transport oxygen from the lungs to the various tissues, which uh, are actively respiring and require oxygen. Now there are um, transport systems, for example, um, if you need to bring various uh, molecules across cell membrane, right? So, so there are um, active transport mechanisms based on that. And for example, lactose permease transports lactose, which is a sugar across cell membrane. <coughs> Proteins can, um, uh, have structural properties, right? So for example, collagen, keratin, there's another one actually for keratin, I have a nice picture of a black rhino. You can see here the horn of the black rhino, 
has been associated with aphrodisiac properties for many years and has been the highly desirable um, object for um, poachers, right? And um, and but it's it's just a strong protein known as um, uh, keratin, right? So uh, which is also keratin component of our fingernails, right? Our fingernails, hair. So if you, for example, if you crush the horn of the of a black rhino into a powder and do the same with your fingernail then you end up with the same protein same material right so you can hardly call the fingernails as aphrodisiac material right and so here is where science tells you that something is not quite right there all right and obviously then uh, <clears throat> And there are proteins which are responsible for motion, right? So uh, cells have to move, have to migrate. So not all cells are stuck in their tissue, right? And um, they have to change shape to do that, right? So if you have a, a tissue and the cell needs to escape, for example, from the tissue, right? Or move relative to the other cells in the tissue, you need protein, for example, such as actin right, which will change the shape of the cell. Now, this can actually be a good one or a bad one, depending on which protein, with, depending on which cell we're talking about. And uh, so, for example, again, if it's, it's a normal cell, very important for, the, for it to change shape for a variety of functions. If it's a cancer cell, again, um, you don't want the actin to be super active, right? So because, as we know, that 90% of cancer patients die of tumor metastases, right? When the cancer cell uh, migrates from the original uh, tumor site into the bloodstream, then it gets carried by the bloodstream into a new site in the body and starts a new growth somewhere else. And so actin will be a key molecule for that to happen because the cancer cell basically will have to squeeze in between other cells squeeze through this extracellular matrix and um, get into the bloodstream. So there are a lot of actually, um, so far actually, interestingly enough, there is no drug which has been approved to treat cancer, which is based on targeting actin. And the problem is, is that targeting actin um, results in, in highly toxic uh, side effects, right? So, um, but it's a very important target that is being studied right now to develop new anti-cancer drugs. And hopefully in the future, we will learn how to differentiate between um, normal cells and cancer cells in terms of targeting their actin. A protein. All right, so, so hopefully this overview gave you some idea of what proteins do in a cell. And obviously um, the 20 amino acids that we're gonna study are key to understanding uh, how these perform their function, whether it's catalysis, right? Whether it's transport, whether it's responsible for structure or motion. All right, so uh, so why amino acids? So if we go one slide forward, what do we see here? We see that amino acids, uh, the reason why they call them amino acids is because they have an amino group and they're acids, they're acids. And so, uh, which allows one to make a polymer, right? So uh, let's go back. So one of the key uh, reasons why amino acids are so useful in, in making proteins is because they have the capacity to polymerize, the capacity to polymerize. And we'll, we'll, we'll start making peptides later in this chapter. 
and you will see that actually um, the peptides which are made through the polymerization of amino acids have uh, very strong amide bonds, uh, which um, make these polymers quite stable to various bases and acids under physiological conditions. Now, they also have useful acid-based so capacity to polymerize. They also have useful acid-based properties, okay? So uh, uh, very important in terms of how they respond to pH, how they respond to pH, how the pH can um, change their three-dimensional structure, right? Um, and obviously now if you think about amino groups that can be protonated, right, and deprotonated, Carboxylic groups can be protonated, deprotonated. So depending on the pH, this could be protonated or deprotonated and, and this one too. Depending on the pH, you can change drastically the ionization properties of amino acids and, um, and thus their biological function. All right, useful acid-base properties. Varied physical properties. So the physical properties will come from this group R. What is this group R? Depending on what this group R is, it will endow our amino acid with specific uh, physical properties, right? The group R can be large, can be small, can be charged, can be neutral, polar, nonpolar, and that will change the properties of the result in amino acid and thus the peptide. And varied chemical functionality. So this group R can have a different functionality. And why is that important? Is because it can undergo or facilitate different chemical reactions, right? So the group R, uh, so we talked about um, proteins as enzymes. And so the groups R play key roles in, in, in these functions, right? So, so the group R, depending on what, the, what it is, it can catalyze a different reaction of proteins. All right. So the alpha carbon, what do we call alpha carbon? This is the alpha carbon so uh, any amino acid that um, is part of a protein will have a basically carboxylic group, right? And we will usually draw the carboxylic group on top and we will draw the amino group on the left group R on the bottom and hydrogen on the left, sorry, on the right. Now, this is the convention. And um, when we draw the amino acid this way, we're gonna call this as L-amino acid. L-amino acid. So all of the 20 amino acids are L-amino acids. So um, it doesn't mean that uh, now, this is uh, the key to understanding this. So even though it's a 12 L amino acid, it doesn't mean that it will rotate the plane polarized light in the uh, counterclockwise direction. Remember L versus D, right? Lever rotatory versus dextra. Uh, so um, this convention came from a scientist, Emil Fisher, who basically proposed this based on the structure of glyceraldehyde. So uh, glyceraldehyde, if you draw this using the Fisher projection, it will have this structure. It 
will have this structure. Like so. And we can call this as L. Sorry. Eraser. Pen. L. Glee Seraldehyde. The Seraldehyde. And because the OH is on the left and H is on the right, right? Which is going to be the same in amino acids, right? When you put, when you draw the amino group on the left and hydrogen on the right, this will be an L amino acid. L amino acid. Now, D amino acids also present in biological systems. But they pr primarily um, occur in microbiological world, right? So there are some um, components, for example, of a bacterial cell wall. So you may have heard of um, how penicillin works. Basically, penicillin mimics the amino acid D-alanine. D-alanine. And the penicillin, the way it works, it um, prevents the biosynthesis of the bacterial cell wall. And <clears throat> there's D-alanine, which is one of the key amino acids involved in the formation of the bacterial cell wall. And penicillin actually binds to a fragment which contains two, two alanine amino acids together. So, um, so, so D amino acids are present, and obviously in the D amino acid, you will have the amino group on the right and hydrogen on the left, right? So the other way around, but very rare, very rare. All right. Um, Okay, what else do we need to say here? Um, well, if we something, if we got something, we'll come back to the slide. So glyceraldehyde, L amino acid, D alanine. Don't forget about penicillin, I mentioned that. Penicillin. So, um, so the alpha carbon obviously will always have four substituents and is tetrahedral. Okay, so um, so all amino acids will have a basically carboxylic group, right? Amino group and a hydrogen. Carboxylic group, amino group, and a hydrogen and some kind of group R, and this group R will tell which of the twin amino acids it is, okay? Uh, now, the fourth substituent is unique in a way that when R equals H, then alpha carbon 
is no longer asymmetric. So in all amino acids, alpha carbon, remember it's a chiral center, AC metric, asymmetric. In R equals H, which will be the amino acid glycine. This alpha carbon is no longer asymmetric because we have two substituents which are the same, right? Two hydrogens. So uh, alpha carbon is not, is not asymmetric anymore. So that's the only amino acid which is not chiral. Glycine. And it's also the simplest amino acid, right? So there's no group R, just, just a hydrogen. Okay, so um, here's a protein contains L amino acids only. So here is L alanine, carboxyl on top, R group on the bottom, amino group on the left, hydrogen on the right. And now this will be D-alanine, where the hydrogen and the amino group switch their positions, right? And you can draw the structure of amino acid using this way, with this kind of dashed and the, and the um, bolt, um, wedge, wedges. Or you can just simply use the straight lines, because we know that this, these are Fisher projections, right? So remember, <laughs> from organic chemistry, Fisher, Fisher projections. All right, projections. Okay, now the important thing, so naming. Let's spend the uh, next, what, how much time we have? About 25 minutes. Let's spend uh, the rest of our time today, today on naming amino acids. So here are the 20 amino acids. Okay, we're gonna look at their structures on, um, in our uh, next next uh, um, meeting, yeah, when we discuss chapter three. So, so here let's look at the um, perhaps maybe the origin of where these came from. So, um, The best way to remember, I am not a big proponent of memorization, but if you can um, have some kind of uh, context, right? If you uh, have some kind of um, guides that can uh, point to a certain um, origin, for example, of these, then it will be much easier to remember the, uh, the three letter names, uh, the full names, and obviously one letter, single letter names. So um, let's look at um, the easiest would be to name the these six amino acids C, which is cysteine, right? This is the only amino acid that starts with the letter C, so it's very easy to name it C cysteine. Then H, which is histidine, right? The only amino acid that starts with the letter H. I, which will be isoleucine. Again, the only one that starts with an I. M, methionine. 
the only one that starts with the letter M. S, which is serine, okay? And V, which is valine. So six amino acids are very much straightforward to name and they just, just go by the first letter and there is no other amino acid among the 20 that starts with these letters. All right, five others. Five others. So here we will have uh, alanine. Now, so these ones will not be, uh, now you can see for alanine, there is also aspartate and asparagine somewhere. It's aspartate and, and at the bottom here, and there's asparagine, right? So, uh, so which one will be A? And it's the one that is most common, okay? So alanine is it's the one that is most common. So, um, so let's just write down that these are unique. And these will be the most common. So A, alanine. G, glycine. Now you can see that there is also, besides glycine, there's also uh, glutamate somewhere. Glutamine and glutamate, they're at the bottom. So, uh, so we're gonna name, we're gonna use letter G to name glycine because that's the most common. So then L, leucine. Leucine. Uh, P which is proline. P proline. And uh, T threonine. Threonine. And these ones will be most common. Most common. <laughs> So, um, and so you can see that, uh, so again, L, we, there are uh, unfortunately more than one choice, right? So there's also lysine. There's also lysine somewhere, okay, 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 okay. Right, so lysine also starts with an L. Um, proline, for example, we have what, we have phenylalanine that starts with the, with the P. Threonine, we have tyrosine. Where's our tyrosine? Tyrosine right there, right? That starts with the T. So, so these are gonna be most common. So for another four, we will use the letter. 
which is phonetically suggestive. So what does this mean? So let's say R. This will be arginine. Arginine. I'm curious about this one actually. Why didn't oh, okay? So arginine starts with the letter A because we already have A, which is alanine and aspartate and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, phonetically suggestive. So arginine F. You may have guessed it's gonna be phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. Even though phenylalanine starts with a P. We're gonna um, label this as F. Phenylalanine. So uh, hold on a second. Let me erase this. Phenylalanine. All right, uh, tyrosine. So we already have T for threonine, so we can't use T. So for tyrosine, we're gonna use this Y and it's phonetically suggestive. Ty, tyrosine. Right, tyrosine. And then the funniest one is the W. It's like for somebody who struggles with pronoun pronouncing letter R, right? Like if you can't roll your R rrr, like this, then uh, you would you would use um, you would say not tryptophan, you would say tryptophan. Whip the fan. To whip the fan. Like that. Now this is going to be the large W. With the fan. Okay, so we call these what? Phonetically suggestive. Whip the fan. Now the rest were harder to assign. Okay, so what, what else do we have left? 
So uh, we're dealing with um, D. If we find D, that's going to be aspartate or aspartic acid. So we will um, refer to it as aspartic. Aspartic times it. Ten minutes left. We're right on time. So aspartic. Then um, N asparagine. and asparagine, like so. Then, uh, now this is a funny one, glutamic, glutamic acid, glutamic acid. So glutamic, it's gonna be E, right? Glutamic acid is gonna be E. Glutamic Glutamic and the last one is a uh, glutamine. So um, It was assigned the letter Q, Q to mean. Well, hopefully this will be a little bit of help guys when you, when you learn the um, names of amino acids and uh, three letter abbreviations and one letter abbreviations. This is something that we do need to know. Okay, and there are only 20 of them, but uh, given the importance of these twin amino acids in the rest of the year, basically, you will be using this in this semester and in the next semester when you take the um, uh, uh, metabolism. When you take metabolism, uh, all these will come in handy. And so there's the last one, but my favorite one. So lysine, what do we have for lysine? That's all our lysine. Well, you can see lysine was given the letter K. Lysine was given the letter K. Now this is, this is uh, Q. And why is letter K? Because, because K is close to L in the alphabet. In alphabetical order. in the alphabetical order. All right. Um, now, K is actually, lysine is my favorite amino acid because a lot of um, research that is done in my lab actually focuses on developing fluorescent probes 
for lysine amino acid in proteins. Basically, we fluorescently labeled various proteins with various dyes, bright dyes, and we use amino acid lysine to do that. All right, so we're almost out of time. Now, uh, in so then during our next lecture, we will be talking about uh, structures of amino acids. So we're going to go over each structure in great detail, try to understand how it will affect the physical properties of amino acids themselves and peptides. We'll talk about ionizations, witterines. We'll talk about titration, negative charge, positive charge, about buffering capacity, let's say glycine, and buffering capacity, for example, of histidine. Okay, so that. That is all, it all makes sense. All right, so um, thank you for being with me and thank you for giving your best to study. And hopefully I'll see more comments in the discussion section of the canvas. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna stop this meeting.